get started. Welcome everyone to our TCBG seminar, Theoretical and Computational Biophysics Seminar. Uh, uh, today, I have the pleasure to host uh, Dr. Casper Locker from ETH Zurich, who is going to uh, speak to us about uh, exciting new ABC transporter structures. Before introducing Casper, let me actually remind everyone of a few housekeeping uh, kind of uh, uh, instructions. So I encourage again everyone to keep their cameras on. So that way you might have a more kind of um, um, interactive um, uh, feel in the in the seminar. But please turn off your microphones. Uh, we keep the questions toward the end of the seminar, unless there is really, really pressing questions that you have to ask by interrupting the, the speaker, please try to keep them uh, short and uh, uh, limited as much as possible. So we keep the questions toward the end. You can type your questions or the fact that you have a question in the chat box, then I'm gonna invite you to actually ask your question yourself at the end. So that way you can ask your question in person and the speaker can respond to your questions. Uh, otherwise, it's really my pleasure to introduce Casper Locker. So Casper uh, uh, received his initial training <clears throat> in chemistry and biochemistry at ETH Zurich, the uh, renowned uh, univer technical university in Switzerland. And then he obtained a PhD in biochemistry um, from the University of Basel, also in, in Switzerland, and during which he worked with the famous lab of Jörg Rosenbusch, very well known in crystallography and structural determination of proteins. Then he moves to uh, the famous lab of Doug Rees at Caltech in 1999, uh, where he did his postdoc and actually he was involved again in the structural determination of membrane proteins. And he did the first X-ray structure of an ABC transporter during this period. Then he moves back to Switzerland and joins the faculty at ETH where he uh, went uh, through the ranks and in 2013 he became a full professor of molecular membrane biology. Um, as I alluded to already, Casper's research is focusing on structural and functional and mechanistic uh, studies of membrane proteins in general, but also on some enzymes. I, I didn't know about that part of your work, Casper. So, but also membrane associated enzymes that are involved in glycosyl transfer reactions. Um, he, uh, he has been applying X-ray crystallography obviously as a traditional method, but uh, over the last few years, like many other researchers, he has moved to the exciting field of uh, cryo-EM, single particle structural determination uh, of membrane associated systems. Um, uh, and this is actually something that we are very interested in. Uh, we, we do a study, a lot of ABC transporters in the lab, and that has continued to, to be one of the main foci of Casper's uh, research. He has received a lot of awards. I'm not gonna list them all, but just to name a few, he is, has received the FEPS letters, Young Investigator Awards, and also uh, he is an elected member of EMBO European Molecular Biology Organization, and also uh, a member of the German National Academy of Sciences. So thank you very much, Casper, uh, to accept our invitation. I, I look forward very much to learn more about the new structural information and uh, news that you have in the ABC transporter field. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Emad, for the uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, visiting online. It would be an even greater pleasure to visit in person. And I'm sure um, as soon as this is over, we will we will do this and then I'll be happy Absolutely. to travel to the campus and meet with you guys uh, in person. So um, I would like, I originally planned on talking about three ABC transporters, but given some more recent results, I've decided to only talk about two of them. And these are the multi-drug transporters ABCB1 and ABCG2. And at the end of the talk, um, I will uh, look at the results we've recently published in BioArchives, or just uploaded to BioArchives today, 
and um, they're now under consideration in some journal that uh, I'm not sure what they're going to do with it. But hopefully, um, in the spirit of uh, of of uh, quickly sharing results, we've just uploaded them to bioarchives, and I think they might be of interest to at least some of you. So I'm going to start um, sharing my screen and hope that this um, works well. Let me try this. Here we go. I hope you can all see this. Otherwise, please protest. Um, so here is the, let me get the laser pointer. This is a view of our campus, which is uh, split in two. This part of the campus is outside of the city. In fact, this building is where we are located. We have, um, when the weather is nice, a very beautiful view of Lake uh, Zurich down here. This would be downtown, and this would be where the all the fat cats would be in banks. And as we have learned recently, the more the even richer people are not in the banks here. The even richer people are a little bit up the left hill here. That's where the soccer federation, FIFA headquarters is. And um, so this is uh, they 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 co commute between a bank and the headquarters, and occasionally they get arrested for um, uh, embezzlement of money or something like this. So we have the pleasure of watching all this, but we also go skiing in the mountains back here. And uh, this, is, uh, this is just a view, so you can imagine what it looks like from our side. So I will <clears throat> talk today on ABCB1 and ABCG2. This is the systematic nomenclature. They are also called peak glycoprotein and BCRP, breast cancer related protein. These are ABC transporters of the human body that are expressed in many, many membranes. They're not very specific. They're in many tissue barriers. And um, here are schematically shown many organs of our body. And in purple, you can see the, the um, membrane boundaries or, or tissue boundaries uh, that contain these transporters. And in black are the arrows where the transport direction is shown. So we need these transporters because they move a lot of toxins or toxic substances that we take up with our food. Probably they were introduced, introduced to us as we started eating more plants as early animals, uh, because plants have alkaloids and we need to get rid of them. And in, in part, some of these transporters also have real endogenous substrates. For example, ABCG2 moves riboflavin into uh, milk um, or urate out of the kidney cells into, into urine. But most of what they do is really, they have gained notoriety for moving drugs. And this is tremendously important for our bodies and also for the pharmaceutical industry because these transporters impact the pharmacokinetics of almost any drug that we take. And then there's an effect, of course, on drug-drug interactions and on the clin clinically relevant drug disposition, for example, in a, in a tissue like the brain, where there's a very strong concentration of these transporters at the blood-brain barrier, um, drugs that we would like to deliver in the brain are, have a hard time getting in, and therefore these, um, these transporters are important when it comes to drug disposition. They've also gained notoriety for their role in multidrug resistance of cancer cells. And even though they're not, the, this is not the only mechanism by which cancer cells get uh, resistant. In fact, it's one of many mechanisms, but often overexpression of these proteins correlate with poor outcome in patients. And it's often the case that drugs that we try to use to, to um, poison these tumors, here's a tumor shown, are then not working anymore. And not one of, not a single drug, but suddenly all of them because the overexpression kicks all of these drugs out of the cell. So for the brain, this can be shown uh, here. This is an experiment from Alfred Schinkel's lab, which demonstrates in the um, mouse brain, or I forgot if it's a rat brain, um, the fact that if you remove one of the two transporters, either ABCB1 or ABCG2, there is still leftover resistance at the blood-brain barrier. And this indicates that there's a certain overlap in substrate specificity 
of ABCB1 and ABCG2. They're sometimes called the sister proteins. They're not really because they are um, architecturally quite different. But in terms of their function, they're often found together in membranes and have a combined role of extruding drugs. When both of these transporters are removed, suddenly then the brain gets very, very sensitive. And even something as um, mild, we would think as cleaning agents would then kill the mice very quickly. So this is a demonstration of this overlap. What is my group interested in? So when I got into this business during my postdoc time with Doug Reese, I dreamed of being able to visualize how human PGP or human ABCB G2 interacted with the many, many substrates that are, that are transported and could explain perhaps how chemically similar looking molecules are not only not transported, but are very strong inhibitors. And this has been a dream for a long time, and it would never have come to fruition if it weren't for the developments in cryo-EM. So until, as Emma pointed out, a few years ago, we were doing everything we could to get X-ray structures of these molecules, and we failed miserably, and we spent millions on this and, and many, many man years. And by now, we have sold or given away our last crystallization robot and all we do is cryo EM, and we and, and and this has really been a game changer for us. So this slide is the overview of what we're interested in. We're trying to understand how ABCB1 on the left and ABCG2 on the right recognize their targets uh, or their substrates, transport them, what conformational uh, changes are needed, and how is all of this inhibited, either by um, small molecule inhibitors or by antibodies. There is a potential for application in diagnostics or therapy. We are doing a little bit of that in collaboration, but um, this is not the main thrust of the lab. The main thrust of the lab is to understand how these proteins work. So I will start with our research on ABCB1 and then go to ABCG2 where we have the most recent results. So for those of you who are not familiar with ABC transporter, a very brief reminder that this is a large superfamily that contains transmembrane domains, two of them, then something that we call coupling helices. This is an interface to the nucleotide binding domains. There are again, two of them. And these nucleotide binding domains are cytosolic or exposed to the cytosol. They um, hydrolyze ATP, sometimes two functional sites, sometimes only one, depending on the transporter. And then in bacteria, there are a lot of importers. In humans, most of the transporters are exporters, and there are only very limited folds then in the transmembrane domains in humans. What is very conserved is this nucleotide binding domain. It's shown very schematically here. All the key motifs are at the shared interface of the two domains. So that would be right here between the two nucleotide binding domains. That's where ATP is bound, trapped, and hydrolyzed. And that motion is coupled to opening and closing of gaps between these nucleotide binding domains. And by moving the coupling helices now, conformational changes in the transmembrane domains occur. And that's how transport is catalyzed. So if we stay with this B family, and it also looks like the D family of human transporters, they're quite interesting in that their transmembrane domains extend quite a bit, about 15 angstroms into the, um, the cytosol. And that means that the NBDs, which are shown here, are offset a little bit from the membrane. They're quite remote. And this has led to an enormous conformational flexibility. And in fact, these are just a few structures, and this is now a few years old. In the meantime, we could show even more structures. It is well recognized that most of these transporters are quite flexible, in particular, if given the freedom. If we trap them, for example, by giving them specific inhibitors or substrates or trapping them with ATP or mutations, that's how we can um, limit that flexibility and also have a chance at getting high resolution information. We have to realize though, that if we do that, this is only a snapshot then because we're trapping something that may or may not be relevant for understanding the transport cycle. And we'll get back to this idea a little bit later on.
So I'm, I'm trying to just go through the mechanism of ABCB1, drug extrusion and inhibition, the way I understand it in a simplified way. It has been long known that there are inward facing conformations where the NBDs are completely separated. I'm just gonna show uh, an example here from Jeffrey Chang's lab. This was the first ABCB1 structures from mouse and it was done with or without so cyclic inhibitors, um, NBDs are separated, clearly inward open, and this could, may or may not bind uh, ADP, so um, not ATP, otherwise it would, it would start to close. So these are confirmations that, uh, confirmation that we understand. There's another confirmation, sometime during the transport cycle, we need a fully outward open confirmation. Here's an example. This is my own work um, for a bacterial transporter. This confirmation can be remarkably hard to obtain. We haven't been able structurally to get this with ABCB1, and there are other transporters for which this may actually be a transient confirmation, not a low energy state. But we nevertheless assume this must occur to release substrate outside. Then there's something that is unfortunately sometimes called outward facing. And here's the structure from Ju Chen's lab. Um, this is a mutant E2Q uh, in the Walker B motif, two ATPs bound. The reason why I don't wanna call this outward facing is that if you're looking at this translocation pathway, it is completely collapsed. There is zero space for any substrate to bind. So this is why I'm drawing this schematically like this. This is an important part of the transport cycle because we want to make sure that we don't open uh, a channel from the outside to the inside at any point that would bleed the cell potentially to its death. So, but the question that we had a few years ago is what distinguishes if something is a substrate in green or an inhibitor in red? And that's what we set out to do. I'm gonna show you these two structures. I'm sure some of you have seen them in the literature. To obtain high resolution, we're using these inhibitory fabs. If we don't use these fabs, we see similar states, but at much lower resolution. We can only see helical density features, not the side chains. What we did observe is that under these conditions, of the, with the wild type protein, an occluded pocket starts to form in this part of the, um, of the membrane. And that's where we see density for, in this case, a substrate, uh, paclitaxel or taxol sometimes uh, called. The density for this is not as clear as the surrounding um, residues. And that has to do with the fact that this is not an inhibitor. It's a very flexible substrate in the pocket. I'm showing you a similar density of increasing a little bit later on. If we take an inhibitor like Sozukidar, we were quite surprised to see that they seem to bind in pairs. And so far, every inhibitor that we've characterized structurally binds in pairs. I'll show you a few structures later on. It's the same pocket that we're talking about. So they are really competitive in the sense that they would preclude a substrate from binding here. They also lead to an occluded conformation, but now the density really fits the molecule like a glove. This is a low nanomolar affinity inhibitor. And at this point, the substrate uh, cannot enter anymore and the transporter is dead. Now, what the transporter is not dead about is it can still hydrolyze ATP. And this is a quirk of the B family. Unlike the G family, the, here the NBDs are quite far away and it seems like there is some uncoupling to this. And even when there's an inhibitor, they can hydrolyze ATP at a quite substantial rate. It's not completely dead. Now, this is, a, I think most B family transporters can do that. So then we expanded from here and went to quite a few more um, structures which we did in this case with a different inhibitory antibody. This is the MRK16. I should mention that both of these antibodies were in the race for um, a therapeutic approach. Remember, if these transporters move um, cancer drugs out of cancer cells, the idea of inhibiting them is of course very attractive. You would be able to treat cancer by preventing uh, extrusion from an MDR cell line while at the same time administering the drug. None of these approaches has made it into the clinic. The reason why this hasn't worked is most likely that 
at the um, windows that we would have to use inhibitors or inhibitory antibodies, we're poisoning the body too hard. So especially the blood brain barrier, and we will get everything into the brain that we don't want to get into the brain. Um, and, uh, or if we go lower in, in, in concentration, they're not effective. So while the idea is still interesting, it hasn't really made it into the clinic. So these antibodies are now great as fiducial markers for cryo-EM and allow us to get high resolution structures. I'm only gonna get, go to the to key point here. And these are these um, substrates or inhibitors actually. Here is a substrate, vincristine, that is transported, transport substrate. And these three, elacridar, tericidar, and suzukidar are all inhibitors. Vincristine binds as a single molecule and these th three bind as pairs. And in particular, and you can see that the density is much better for the inhibitors. That makes sense. They're nanomolar inhibitors, whereas the vincristine is a just about micromolar KM drug that is transported quite well. Uh, in, a, in, in agreement with this idea that something that needs to be transported cannot bind too tightly or it will not go through the transporter anymore. We'll get back to this idea a little bit later on with the molecule tericidar. Because as you will see, tericidar is a very strong inhibitor of ABCB1, but it is a slow substrate of ABCG2, where it binds as a single copy. So that's, a, that's an interesting concept of two molecules binding as an inhibitor, at least so far, and one copy as a substrate. We find exactly the same in ABCG2. So for ABCB1, I want to just um, uh, summarize some of these findings. We can now ex understand this pseudosymmetry because the pseudosymmetry in the two halves, the N-terminal half here and the C-terminal half, extends beyond just the fact that they have some the similar same amount of helices and domain architecture. Even the kinks that are needed to build an occluded substrate binding pocket are conserved in these same helices. So number six would be corresponding to number 12, number four would be corresponding to number 10. And it is especially number four and number 10 that kink and, and form an occluded pocket for substrates to bind. We can also see why these inhibitors, inhibitory antibodies work the way they work. They contact similar loops that are close together in one state and do not easily allow the transporter to go to outward open by recognizing this structural motif. So we even have prolines or glycines conserved at the hinge sites in these helices, despite the fact that otherwise these helices are not similar at all in, in sequence. So this leads me to um, a, a mechanistic idea, and it's, it's not a very complicated idea. Here are the four states that I believe are required for productive substrate transport. The most important contribution that we've recently made is this occluded conformation where we can distinguish between one substrate bound or two inhibitors bound, but otherwise quite a similar conformation. I believe that after state four, we would need to hydrolyze two ATPs in order to get back to the first state. A lot of details here are unclear. Um, and I'm gonna shed light on just one of these aspects, but I, I, I truly believe that at this point, it is gonna be very important to do more computation. And uh, I'm, that's why I'm so excited to see that you guys are making progress with this. So when we analyzed these ABCB1 structures, we noticed that even though they were occluded, there is a short um, or, or a narrow path that we call access tunnel in all these structures. And that access tunnel is not filled with, with a bound substrate whenever we're talking about a substrate that is moved. Whenever we're talking about an inhibitor, parts of the molecules or actually molecule number two usually reaches into this, um, into this uh, um, uh, access tunnel. And this suggests, and here the same thing is shown schematically, this suggests that if the access tunnel is used for access for substrate, then the transporter can only proceed to extrude something if that access tunnel is empty. If it's filled, we're stuck. And we can visualize this as follows. We can compare two structures. One is the 
completely collapsed structure from Ju Chen. This is the ABC B1 EQ variant with ATP bound closed collapsed state. This would be in this red here. We compare it with the occluded state in, in cyan. When we did that, we noticed that even though the conformations are quite different, there are two sets of helices that are virtually unchanged. We call them rigid module one and rigid module two. And the numbers of helices are shown here, um, uh, are, are listed here in these sets. Once we accept that, we take these two rigid modules and convert them to surfaces, one white and one yellow. And we only look at the four remaining helices that are moving. And these four remaining helices are number four, number 10, number 12, and interestingly, number nine. Now, this is a helix that we didn't have on our radar as being important for the substrate mechanism. But watch what happens with helix number nine. So here is the combined view of this. In these two states, the occluded and the collapsed states, the um, two rigid modules in white and, 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 and yellow, they essentially move like rigid bodies. But the other helices, they don't. They either kink or move in position. And the helix that we found was the most remarkable was helix TM9, because this is where we saw the difference between substrates and inhibitors. For substrates, we did not see a lot of overlap, except a little bit perhaps here. But for inhibitors, very quickly, we got a, a severe clash with TM9. This, at least to us, suggests that when the transporter tries to transport something and quickly runs into resistance here for TM9, it is trapped because it is an inhibitor, because this is an inhibitory molecule. If it can move beyond this point and get to this conformation, it can proceed with ATP hydrolysis, and now the substrate is peristaltically extruded out of the transporter pocket. It's a simple-minded idea at the moment. Of course, it takes a lot of um, uh, gaps that need to be filled, but we believe TM9 has a role in the peristaltic drug extrusion and will early, be stopped early in its tracks when there's an inhibitor bound. This is all I wanted to say for B1. And I want to go to G2, introduce a few concepts first, and then we'll see some parallels and, and similarities and also differences. The beauty of ABCG2 is like is that unlike other multidrug transporters, here we have a system finally where we have an in vitro transport assay because not all substrates of ABCG2 are so hydrophobic that they partition strongly into the membrane. Eastron sulfate, which is an endogenous substrate, is soluble enough so we can actually do ATP-driven transport from the outside of a liposome to the inside and measure this using radioactivity. This is enormously helpful because it allows us to, um, to uh, um, link our structural data to actual functional data. It's slow in vitro, it's about three molecules per dimer per minute. ABCG2 is a homodimer, it's a half transporter, so these two halves are ident chemically identical. Again, to study this at high resolution, we initially used an inhibitory antibody fragment. This was in, uh, developed by another collaborator, Brian Sorrentino, who in the meantime, unfortunately, passed away. Um, we um, have included, uh, you know, trapped this FAP fragment in the inside of the liposomes because it binds, like the uh, ones against ABCB1, it binds on the outside of the transporter, opposite to the ATP binding site. And when we do that, not only is estron sulfate greatly reduced, the transport of estron sulfate greatly reduced, even the activity of the ATPase um, is greatly reduced. Not as greatly perhaps as you might um, think, it's only down to 40%, but compare this to ABCB1. If you add an inhibitory antibody to ABCB1 to peak glycoprotein, nothing happens in the ATPase activity. Actually, it may even go up. So this is very different. And I think the main difference is that the NBDs here are so close to the TMDs, it's a smaller architecture, that the coupling is tighter. 
this gave us our first structure and we don't need to go into uh, many of the details here. It's a very different architecture. I mentioned already that these loops here are shorter. So the NBDs are closer to the membrane. Um, the di this particular dimer is cross-linked by a disulfide bridge that makes a, a covalent uh, homodimer here. And there's another disulfide bridge out here in this region. And this was in fact the, the reason why we had trouble for 10 years making this protein properly. It was only after hex cell expression was developed to the point where we could go large scale that this protein is folded pro um, properly. Even in insect cells, only half of the protein is properly folded. So um, it's a combination of cryo-EM and hex cell expression that really helped us here. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, you know, walk you through all the details. If you want, you can download the structures, look at these architecture. Let's go immediately to the point that really matters. And that is where are the drugs bound and how do they bind and how do they get across? This is a view of the transmembrane domain. And you can see that in that first state that we have, we have quite a different architecture compared to ABCG, uh, a B1. We have a narrow slit that is accessible from the membrane and from the cytosolic side. And that narrow slit is where we find all the bound substrates and inhibitors. That slit, we call it sometimes cavity one, extends about two thirds into the membrane. Then there's a either leucine plug or gate as we recently started calling it. And behind it is another cavity, which we call the outward cavity or cavity two. This is where the, um, the gating happens. Nothing can go through here. The, the transporter is tight. So uh, in the first structure that we determined, it was in, uh, in, in nanodisks, we found in here actually cholesterol molecules upside down, but we think this is an artifact from us reconstituting this transporter in the presence of large amounts of cholesterol and no other substrate. It affects also the ATPase rate. Whenever we put this transporter in a, in a nanodisc, it has an elevated ATPase rate, similar to the ATPase rate in liposomes when we add substrate. So we have to be aware that the nanodiscs that everybody uses, including us, they are not quite as, as good a mimic for the native membrane as um, a, a, a liposome is, a proteal liposome. Nevertheless, we wanted to study inhibitors, and the most famous inhibitor of ABCG2 is KO143. This is a derivative of Fumitrimorgan C. This one is very neurotoxic, so people develop this one, which is less neurotoxic, again with the idea of inhibiting ABCG2 and, um, and working against multidrug resistance. So collaboration with a synthetic chemist here at ETH, we took these two positions, R1 and R2, in this uh, scaffold and made a whole range of, um, subst of inhibitor analogs to study how these molecules would interact. Of several of them, we have now structures, but only one of them is published so far. Um, the rest is in the pipeline. This particular one has a cyclopental ring attached at the um, R1 site down here. And this leads to a very, very tight binding. And what do we find? We find two inhibitors, a pair of inhibitors blocking this cavity one where we expect drugs to bind. And um, the, the density for them is really wonderful. This fits like a glove. In the, this was about 3.1 angstrom. In the meantime, we have this at 2.8 angstrom, locally at even higher resolution. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. So this is how inhibitors bind. They completely block this cavity here. It gave us an opportunity, and I'm not going to go into all of this, but it, it does give us an opportunity to, to do real SAR, so structure activity relationship, uh, which ph pharmaceutical chemists love to do, medicinal chemists love to do. We made all these compounds. We studied them functionally in vitro using our ATPAs and our transport assays. And again, some of the structural work is underway for these molecules. But you can see that depending on what we do on these two sites, we can get this inhibitor to bind almost not at all anymore. And that tells us, for example, that if we put a positive charge here or something that's too big, then it doesn't bind the pocket anymore. So there's a combination of shape complementarity and 
hydrophobic or hydrophilic match or mismatch that is important for these inhibitors to bind. First structure was done with this molecule, um, Melanie Sechner 29. She was the chemist who, who made this. But there are other molecules, and now we're getting to Taricodar, because Taricodar is a very strong inhibitor of ABCB1, but has been described as a slow substrate of ABCG2. So in collaboration with another chemist, we made this, um, uh, this derivative of Taricodar, which now is only an inhibitor. We don't see any, sub, any transport of this, even though we have a um, radioactive version of this and of Taricodar, but both of them bind so strongly to ABCG2 that the weaker binding estrone sulfate transport is inhibited, not as strongly as with the killer um, inhibitors on the right side here, K0143 and MZ29 that I showed you in a second, but still, these are, especially Taricodar, is a super slow substrate. The analogy is that of a tunnel. So if you drive your car through a tunnel and in front of you is a caterpillar moving at two miles per hour, that would be Taricodar. It really gets in your way. You can't get through because it is a substrate. It gets through, but it takes forever to get through. In contrast, this particular one, MB136, does not get through. Here's how it interacts with the transporter. It, it binds in the same pocket. And this is the only time we can make it as a monomer where we start from Taricodar and we have an inhibitor, but it binds as a monomer. It's a very unusual case. We will see later that Taricodar as a substrate also binds as a monomer, but it actually gets through. So this, is the, um, uh, this was the early work on the inhibitors. And I want to make one more point because we talked with the, with the students also just beforehand, before the meeting, uh, before the talk uh, about lipids. Here are some of the ordered lipids on the surface of ABCG2. That's one of the beautiful things of nanodisks. We can see some of these cholesterols. The densities then look like these torpedoes. And we know this is then a cholesterol. And there is indeed in the literature a description of how important cholesterol is in an almost structural role for the function of ABCG2. If we take cholesterol away and move ABCG2 in a lip liposome without any cholesterol, we almost completely lose function. Actually, it's a hard, we have a hard time to even put it into the liposome. It really takes cholesterol molecule to be active. Okay, so where do the substrates, the real substrates bind? Here is the first one that we looked at. This is the endogenous substrate, ABC, uh, um, estrone sulfate. Single copy of the molecule binds very deep in this cavity. So uh, the, 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 um, the density of this looks like that. In this narrow slit, there are two phenylalanines that form a parallel or that form a that form the slit and form opportunities for stacking aromatic stacking of rings against the phenyl rings and that is a recurring topic every single substrate that we've seen uses this motif to bind to the substrates because g2 is a homodimer we have trouble um, separating which of these molecules it is. You remember, this is single particle um, uh, method. And we would love to, uh, we often treat this as no symmetry, so C1 symmetry, but we still get a pseudo symmetrized density, but we know only one substrate combined. So we've done our mutational analysis. So we've done the work. And the beautiful thing is here, we can actually look at ATPase and at transport. And we've analyzed all these um, residues around bound substrate and found some very interesting effects. I'm not going to go into all of these. Many of these residues just contribute to binding. And that means if we mutate them, binding affinity is lost, transport is lost. But there's something particularly interesting about this valine 546. Um, it is over here. It doesn't actually form much of a contact. But what we tried to do is we tried to replace it with a phenylalanine. And we know that now the substrate cannot bind anymore. And indeed, we have almost no transport. It would clash with the substrate. But we have enormously high levels of ATPase rate. So this is direct, well, I should say indirect evidence, but a good notion, a good, a good idea that just binding a substrate in this cavity is directly 
um, signaled to the NBDs to increase the ATPase rate. All it takes is some mass to bind in this cleft. So then the next state we did is this um, classical trapped state by doing a Walker B mutation from glutamate to glutamine. And this gave us a new confirmation. This is what we call the closed or collapsed confirmation. NBDs are now uh, completely closed. Two ATP binding sites are formed. We find density for two magnesiums and for two nice ATPs. Unlike in other transporters, um, ABCG2 does not have a real A loop, not, does not have uh, an, an aromatic residue stacking against the adenine. In, instead, it has this arginine. And we can discuss that a little bit later too. So the interesting thing is what's different to ABCB1, ABCG2 moves much more in rigid body mode, in rigid body form. So the entire transmembrane domain moves like a rigid body from one conformation to the other, and an angle is imposed between the nucleotide binding and the transmembrane domain. That is the essence of the ATP triggered conformation. And I have a movie here. Uh, I want to go to the movie first. Um, ah, interesting. Now I need to stop the laser pointer. Otherwise, I can't start the movie. So this is the uh oh Okay, I hope you can see the movie. I lost contact there for a second, but um, this is the conformational change. As you can see, the transmembrane domains and the nucleotide binding domains move essentially as rigid bodies, very different from the ABCB family, ABCB1. This conformation, the ABC, the, the ATP bound conformation is a conformation that I would also call uh, a, a, um, a collapsed conformation because even though you could say there's a bit of outward open here in this cavity, the fact is where previously there was a binding site for a substrate, there is now completely um, uh, collapsed um, space, no space at all for um, uh, for a substrate to be here. So the classical concept of an outward open conformation where a substrate could diffuse into this pocket is not what we have here. We believe this also supports the idea of a peristaltic extrusion. So how do actually cancer drugs bind when we're not looking at endogenous but at exogenous substrates? Here we have been scooped a little bit and I guess it was my... Um, uh, my uh, carelessness in presenting this stuff three years ago at a Gordon Research Conference, show, you know, showing all these structures already because we have them for a long time. Uh, but then Maufel Yao's um, group also published um, these, these structures, but they, they didn't use the antibody. And we actually disagree with the way the drugs are bound. We bind them in 90 degree different orientations. We, we just find different um, ways they bind. And I think, it has something to do with the resolution of the map. So we've did, we did, of course, all our functional analysis to make sure that when the antibody is bound, the drugs still stimulate the transporter. So we're not looking at um, uh, an artifact here. And you can see that without the, the um, antibody, of course, all the ATPase rates are higher, but the stimulation is here, even in the um, slightly inhibited uh, state when the, and the antibody is here. This is our control experiment. But then we find for each of these substrates, essentially one copy bound where estron sulfate would also be bound right in the center of this cavity one, this central slit. This is um, thanks to our resolution, we could process all of this with C1 but these densities are really not quite as nice as the densities of inhibitors. And guess which one of these binds the tightest? So one would say, well, probably the one with the, with the best density, right? No, not at all. Tarikudar binds at least 20 times better than any of these over here. Tarikudar um, has a submicromolar affinity for ABCG2, or even in the, in the tens of, the, of nanomolar, depending on the experimental system. But the density is completely lousy. It seems to bind in more than one conformation. This is the so-called C conformation. 
it happens also in ABCB1. It would be uh, in ABCB1, the more deeply buried terricular molecule. But it's evident from this density that there, got, there have to be more than one confirmation of this drug. And I find it remarkable that um, not mitocentron and not topotecan have the um, lousiest of the densities. Nevertheless, if you look at all the density features, it's very clear only one can be bound here. So we again did, um, we demonstrated that through mutagenesis, uh, we, can, we can show which res or dem no, provide evidence that the residues that are in the direct vicinity contribute to the binding of these exogenous drug substrates. We tested here only phenylalanine 439. That's the one that stacks with its phenyl rings, forms this narrow slit, but then also one um, uh, hydrophilic residue, asparagine 436. If we remove this to alanine, you can see here we completely lose ATPase stimulation, and therefore these drugs then don't bind anymore. So all of this, I have to say, is done and, and in fact, the entire field of structural biologists has mostly determined structures of these transporters by trapping them. We trap them by either not giving them a substrate, not giving them ATP, using a mutation of some sort, or using an inhibitory antibody or small molecule. But what do they really look like, these transporters, when we let them run? And this is the experiment now that I was mentioning. This has just been published today on BioArchives. We hope it will be published eventually in a journal by, after peer review. This is ABCG2 under turnover conditions. So we put it into a nanodisc with the best lipids we can. We provide it with ATP and ADP at a cellular ratio. There's of course magnesium. And then we tried an endogenous substrate, estrogen sulfate, and an exogenous substrate, the, the drug topotecan. And we had very different expectations of what would happen, but the one thing we certainly did not expect is that all the, all the um, particles assembled in one of two states that had both ATP bound and topotecan bound. For the smaller substrate, the endogenous one, we found essentially all particles in what we call turnover. And that turnover is very similar to turnover two in topotecan in conformation. For the larger substrate, we found two conformations. One that is um, also a little more inward facing, but also has density for topotecan and two bound ATPs. And I'll show you the comparison to the other um, uh, um, conformations that we have in a second. What I was also surprised about is all these structures are in the three-ish angstrom range. So you can see side chain, dense, chain density here, beautiful. So there's no question about this. This is not very flexible. The transporter really has this as a lowest energy state and it, it populates this, this state with, with, um, uh, you know, with, with great um, probability. So the density for the substrate is again, not very strong. We can see here at least two ways to, to, um, to bind or to dock um, uh, estron sulfate. And then also like in the other, uh, in the other st structures, two ways to, to dock topotecan. Part of this is again, the symmetry problem that we cannot completely resolve. But if we compare top turnover one to turnover two, there is a change in the density because the slit gets narrower. Let me show you what that looks like. Here's a comparison of a previously determined inward open conformation that is also on bioarchives now in the meantime, where we have um, topotecan bound. That's the structure I showed you five minutes ago. Now, um, under turnover conditions with topotecan one and two, and then finally this trapped state with the mutations E to Q. The interesting thing is that look at the access to the central cavity. In turnover one, there is still a little bit of access, but not as much from the membrane anymore. It's only from the cytosol. Whereas here, there is access from the, um, from the side. In turnover two, the, uh, the main state of estron sulfate, there is almost zero access from the membrane and very little left from the cytosol. If the drug wanted to get out of here, 
the TMDs would have to open more. So this is almost an occluded confirmation. And this is very nicely matched by the NBDs closing. And we can measure that by looking at these coupling helices. So the gaps between the NBDs closes, closes, closes until it's completely closed, demonstrating a very rigid coupling of NBDs and TMDs. What does it tell us? It tells us that um, we, can, we can understand now at which point of the transport cycle the, um, the transporter distinguishes whether something's a substrate or an inhibitor or something that can just simply not interact. This is the, estron, this is the, um, the turnover structure of estron sulfate. The substrate is bound and it has just, it is just in, there's just enough space in the cavity to fit the substrate. Mm -hmm. The same is true for topotecan, but it has to rotate compared to the inward open um, conformation. The, the uh, cavity gets narrower. None of the inhibitors would be compatible with the turnover two structures. Mm -hmm. So already moving to turnover two before ATP hydrolysis is incompatible with inhibitors bound. That explains why ABCG2 has such strong ATPase um, inhibition compared to ABCB1 when inhibitors bind. If you bind inhibitors to ABCB1, you still get some ATPase activity. Here, it almost completely stops. And I believe that's the reason. But this is the last slide. And I wanna show that using this information, we can actually come up with an almost complete transport cycle. If you're, if you're interested, um, please read the bioarchives uh, paper. The, the case we're making there is that these steps from inward open or APO inward to the main step, turnover one and the second turnover two steps, this is where the transporter really does its work in interacting with the many substrates and discriminating which substrates to bind, which substrates not to bind, and which substrates inhibit it. That's why I believe if we are to understand the, the vast pharmacology of this transporter, these are the substrate, these are the states that we have to analyze in great detail. It's not the trapped states that we have from previous structures, it's these states where the action happens. So I want to conclude here and um, say that even though these two proteins are sister proteins in function, there are a lot of differences between them. The cavity is more globular in ABCB1, more slit-like in ABCG2. There is full occlusion in ABCB1. So far, we cannot see full occlusion of drugs in ABCG2. The shape and substrates, uh, substrate binding cavities are a little different. There's symmetry versus uh, asymmetry. Um, and, and so a lot to learn um, in, with regard to how they interact. We like to speak of this substrate inhibitor continuum in terms of small molecules that are either good substrates or become inhibitors, just like Tariquidar does. And finally, for um, those who don't believe it yet, um, cryoEM is the method that really um, does something because this last study that I just showed you on turnover, there's no antibody there. Okay, there, this is really the transporter on its own and the resolution is remarkable. So as the, as the microscope gets stronger, I think we can use this for even smaller transporters. I wanna thank here the people involved. So from my group, some of these uh, have in the meantime left. ABCB1, mostly by uh, Amer Alam and, and Kamil Nossal. ABCG2 uh, by Scott, Yanis, Julian Jin. And then the uh, collaborators in chemistry in Karl-Heinz Altmann's group, especially Melanie Zeckner, who did um, most of these synthesis of derivatives of inhibitors. Mm -hmm. We closely collaborate also for methods and uh, for keeping at the top end of, the, of how to use cryo-EM with Henning Stahlberg. And uh, especially Nick Taylor, uh, Dong Ni, and, and Raphael Kung have been useful. I want to thank the uh, additional collaborators and funding. And sorry for going slightly over time. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Casper, for this exciting uh, and so rich structural uh, talk. So I really enjoyed and I think uh, many of the projects we are doing in the lab are heavily enriched. We really look forward to read more details in your biochive papers, the February and the March ones. And uh, so I have a lot to discuss uh, with my students about that. Thank you so much. This was 
exciting. This is very nice to see how far you can go with electron microscopy in terms of resolution and then capturing real states and intermediates. This is really exciting. I have many questions myself, so I'm going to start with one of them at least, and if I get a chance, we can ask more. So uh, in terms of the, uh, this A loop, you know, we, we discussed it a little bit. Uh, so the A loop is kind of our loop in, um, in, in this protein. So now does that affect the affinity or a specificity for the nucleotide binding at all? It's going from, ad, uh, uh, from A to, um, uh, from, from a residue that stacks with adenine to arginine, does it affect the binding of the nucleotide in any way, affinity-wise or a specificity? So um, that experiment of affinity, we have not done. I wanna show you one thing though, if I, could, if I may share back here. Sure. There's one slide. This is also from this bioarchives paper. Um, this is the, di the difference between turnover one and turnover two. We can see very nice density for ATP in both cases, but in turnover two, this arginine already starts to make contact. And as you, as you may remember, it comes from the other NBD, right? Okay. So it, it starts to make contact here and it links because this is a part of the stretch that leads from up here to mm -hmm. the LSGGQ motif. It yeah. links to residues that are very close by that make the contact between the TMDs. So there is a direct connection between closing the gap binding ATP and getting it ready for hydrolysis and, um, and moving the NBDs together. But what we have not measured is whether this affects the actual affinity. That's a hard experiment to do um, to determine um, affinities of ATP. But if you look here, the density, obviously there are more contacts uh, and ATP density is nicer here than it is um, over here, but there's no doubt the molecule is here. I see. I see. Okay, fair enough. So one more question, and then we can move to other questions. So in terms of coupling between the NBDs and the TMDs, so you mentioned that G2 has a much better, tighter coupling between the two. So are there any clear structural elements sort of giving this tighter coupling? So like the coupling helices are there, but are there additional contacts between the two domains that sort of uh, make it a tighter coupling? Um, it, it is, I think the interface between the TMD and the um, NBD is perhaps a little bit larger, but I think it's really the fact that the TM helices in B1 are so much longer that this kinking is becoming you know, a, a, an important element. And that kinking automatically kind of uncouples what's going on up there with the NBDs. And it's only when the NBDs are really closed, then there's no option, then, then everything has to, uh, fall in line, so to speak. But right. as long as the NBDs can stay apart, it's just the pure distance that, that, that doesn't allow G2 to do any kinking. So G2 TMDs move like rigid bodies. They do not um, do any, any kinking. Very nice. Actually, I think we, we made a similar conclusion a few years ago, and I remember when we published a paper on PGP, Kocha's work. Okay, so uh, let's move on to other questions. Shashank. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, in the case of ABC B1, you mentioned uh, that ATP hydrolysis can also happen or can take place even in the presence of inhibitor. So does it mean uh, like in the presence of inhibitor, NBDs are in the decoupled conformation and they, they are highly dynamic and can also exist in a dimerized form? Th th that, that would be my assumption. I think there is... Um... One could, of course, make the argument that the actual hydrolysis step is a, a little bit different in the case of an inhibitor, but I think the easiest um, interpretation would be the NBDs can still approach, even if the TMDs have to wrap around these inhibitory molecules. It does take a little bit more, and that's why there's a, a little bit of slowing down, but they're not, it, it doesn't seem to be a major obstacle such as in ABCG2, where it's a major obstacle. We cannot get the, uh, the NBDs fully together if there's an inhibitor bound between the TMDs. I think that would be my interpretation. It's hard to prove. Yeah, mm. okay, thank you. Karan? Yeah, uh, I had a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, so you suggested two mechanisms of inhibition where two molecules of inhibitors bind, either together in the binding pocket or one extended in the 
excess tunnel. So is it, is it possible maybe instead of a molecule bound to the excess tunnel, there are probably some lipids bound there or do you see some lipid densities there that can potentially block with one molecule bound to the central cavity and the lipids kind of inside there? No, we never see that. But now I have to, of course, um, uh, make, give a warning statement here. And that is, this is single particle analysis. So we are selecting the particles and the particles are selected to be um, to be contributing as well as possible to a particular structure. If we were to search for something else, we may potentially find it. But if it's a very small fraction of particles that have a lipid bound somewhere, and that we're, we want that we want to see that density, we may not we may not get the resolution because we may need a lot more particles. So there are limitations to single particle, and one of them is precisely that. If you're looking at a sub class that may have something else bound, but it's overall the same conformation of the protein, very difficult to find. So if I tell you we haven't seen it, that does not mean it does not exist. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, another question. So in, in the PGP transition cycle, you kind of suggested that Juchen structure is a kind of occluded structure and a post-transport occluded structure. Can it instead be like a substrate less be bound PGB structure that PGB samples in the absence of a substrate that can possibly lead to the basal ADBase activity. So can it be probably placed somewhere before, but in a in a different kind of a cycle? well. So so what you're saying is, um, if it's before, but the, the nucleotide binding domains are closing, then to me that is the definition of a futile ATPA cycle because you cannot prevent these NBDs from hydrolyzing, yeah. Yeah. and. Yeah. In, in our, if you then read our, our BioArchives paper on ABCG2, we actually specifically invoke this. Futile ATP hydrolysis is an integral part, in my opinion, of, of uh, ABC transporters. We cannot completely prevent that. We even did a bit of an analysis now in ABCG2 because we have quantitated every aspect of it, you know, transport, ATP hydrolysis. I think it actually takes multiple rounds of ATP hydrolysis of attempts to hydrolyze ATP to move something across. It, doesn't, it isn't successful the first time. So what you're saying is in principle possible, but what, we, what we're of course trying to formulate is a productive transport cycle. And in such a cycle, I believe Chu Chen's collapsed state has a role right after transport. That's, that will be my interpretation. Can it happen under other, under other circumstances? Yes, it can potentially. By the way, we tried to make that same structure. We were just a little bit late. And in order to get that structure to be um, highly populated, you need to add substrate. Because if you don't, you get largely inward facing ABCB1, even though you have EQ. It's remarkable. Okay. Nice. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Very nice. So, Casper, I mean, I was a little, uh, I shouldn't use disappointed, but we usually actually promote the research on these uh, proteins as, as good targets for drug and uh, for, to, for inhibition. And then you are, you are telling us this is a very dangerous undertaking because it's going to poison the patient and it's going to have very bad side effects. Is that idea completely out? And no, 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 no. It, it's, it's not out. It's out as a general cure for all MDR in cancer. Otherwise, it's very much in, and there's a great need for understanding the molecules better. I can give you two examples. So mm -hmm. in certain ovarian cancer and medulloblastoma, John Schutz has shown very clearly that AVCG2 is a therapeutic target and okay. that you could uh, try to, um, to target it. Then ABCB1 is very much a target for allowing oral uptake of, of drugs um, through the gut by briefly inhibiting the function of ABCB1 while it is, while you're taking these, or these drugs, um, allowing the drugs to diffuse. And actually we have, a, we have a collaboration with a company that has developed such a drug um, and we've determined the structure um, of such a compound to show them how it binds. And this is very much um, still alive. But you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the idea was one inhibitor and we're gonna solve cancer, you know? Mm -hmm. I see. It's so, not that, that's going to work locally in the GI. It doesn't get absorbed to act on the brain ones. And that's the way you 
make it selective only for GI ABCB ones, right? Is yes, you would basically you would basically use a dosage that uh, poisons B one for for just a, mo a few hours in the GI tract. I see. Give I a see. drug that you don't want to inject, and now it goes across. Interesting. Very nice. Any other questions from the audience, Ali? I, I have one question. So I'm really excited to read the latest bio archive. And uh, so this um, turnover state, uh, you said that there is no, uh, in any way you didn't trap it, right? No. Uh, like no inhibitor, no uh, mutation. So this is actually very uh, energetically favorable uh, for the transporter. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it, we, we, we allow the transporter to do whatever it wants. It could jump, it could run, it could bind substrate, it could unbind them. And we were just, we, we, we collected a monster of a data set and we were just looking at what do we find? Mm -hmm. And we were, we were fully, um, you know, we were fully ready to accept defeat and find only particles that we cannot classify. And instead we found um, one, or in, in the other case, two confirmations that were very well defined with side chain resolution. And you can, we can look at the maps, it's remarkable. What we did not find is um, the collapsed confirmation or a confirmation where, where there is, it's completely inward facing and no, no density of substrate and of ATP. I should again qualify that. If there are such particles, there are very few and they do not allow us to go beyond maybe 15 angstrom resolution. So they're not well enough um, uh, defined. And that classifies these structures that we see as low energy states because they're not only structurally well defined, they're also well populated. Mm -hmm. I should say one more thing if you're working on ABCG2 because um, Mao Fu Liao has made a comment about an APO state you know, that is, uh, in, a, in my opinion, has a collapsed transmembrane domain. We see no evidence of this at all under turnover conditions, and we looked for it very, very hard. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, this is a pure artifact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess we're going to have a long conversation, Ali, about everything we learned today and your project. <laughs> Great. OK, any other questions? No. And, and if you're interested, you know, we can always um, discuss potential collaborations. I'm, I'm not collaborating with anybody on the oh, on, uh, oh, on com by competition. By so, all means, actually, I, I was wondering if I should offer that or not, whether you're working with someone. By all no, means, not at the moment. We, should, we should touch base. We, there, we have so much in common, actually, uh, research wise, so that we should definitely start actually uh, working. So, let us go over these bioarchive papers and your latest results and digest them a little bit more and we discuss with Ali and I'm sure we're going to get back to you in more detail what we have and what we're planning to do actually. That would be wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much again for uh, kind of staying at work a little late. Oh, no worry. Your time. <laughs> but, but we really enjoyed the talk and I think it resonated very well with the, with the group. Uh, thanks again uh, for being with us and uh, have a great evening. Well, thank you for having me and have a great, um, I guess, uh, lunch soon. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye-bye.